Man, oh man. Many have called this the best record ever made. Uh, they've called it the ultimate rock and pop disc. It's the ultimate expression and illustration of a recording technique that hundreds of icons have tried to copy, but they've never equaled it. I mean, this very well could be the pinnacle of our programming on this channel. With historic interviews with the songwriters and the last remaining member of this duo that recorded the song, they're here to tell the definitive story of, of a classic. This song hit number one. It was the most played radio song of the 20th century. Yet the singer felt that it had no chance of even getting airplay because the song was too long. Back then, artists could only get airplay if their songs were three minutes or less. So they actually sent in the tape and lied about its length. They wrote down 305, even though it was really four minutes long. Stories coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists of the greatest songs of all time especially today. You know, if music lifts your soul, you're going to want to subscribe below to our channel right now so you never miss an episode of our daily features. Click the bell, all that good stuff. Make sure to check us out on Patreon as well to become an insider with us. So it's time for another episode of our series, Revelations. This is where featured artists reveal rare stories about their greatest songs and greatest albums, legendary accounts that you really won't find anywhere else. On this installment of Revelations, we have a very special episode, probably the best episode we've ever had on here. It's actually historic. Many musicians and historians have called uh, this original recording one of the best records ever made and the ultimate pop record. In 1999, the performing rights organization BMI ranked this as the most played song on American radio and television for the entire 20th century. Uh, it had accumulated more than 8 million airplays by 1999. It actually nearly doubled to 15 million by 2011. And it held the title of being the most played song for decades until a couple of years ago when it was overtaken by the police's Every Breath You Take. Every breath you take. I'm talking about the classic hit, You Have Lost That Love and Feeling by The Righteous Brothers. You lost that love and feeling. So I have interviews here. Uh, with the last remaining Righteous Brother, Bill Medley, uh, the main singer behind the classic, as well as the writers of the song, the husband and wife, Brill Building writing duo of Barry Mann and Cynthia Weil. Uh, like I said, it may well be this channel's defining piece of content. In 2001, this song was chosen as one of the songs of the century by the RIAA. It was actually the highest ranking for a song from the rock era. Uh, in 2015, the single was inducted into the National Recording Registry by the Library of Congress for being culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. I mean, I could go on and on and on. This is on every greatest list, greatest songs list ever. Bottom line here is this song has some of the greatest stories connected to it that I've ever heard. It was the ultimate manifestation of Phil Spector's Wall of Sound. Uh, a recording technique, or as some call it, a, a music production formula, was developed by Phil Spector at the historic Gold Star Studios in the 1960s. Uh, he had some assistance from engineer Larry Levine, and of course with the legendary Wrecking Crew. Whoa, by the way, Gold Star Studios doesn't even exist anymore. It's now a shopping center. Isn't that sad? So Phil Spector's intention was to exploit the possibilities of studio recording to create an unusually dense orchestral aesthetic that came across well through you know, radios and jukeboxes of the era. Spector explained in 1964, I was looking for a sound, a sound so strong that if the material was not the greatest, the sound would carry the record. It was a case of augmenting, augmenting. It all fit together like a jigsaw. It's a recording technique that has been so revered by many, inspired a plethora of artists, including Bruce Springsteen, the whole Born to Run record, uh, many records by the Beach Boys, the Beatles, Ramones, all the way to modern artists like Amy Winehouse and the Killers.
This record was a critical and commercial success when it was put out. Hit number one on the US Hot 100. It also topped the UK charts. It ended up uh, ranking number five in Billboard's year-end chart that year. And it's actually entered the UK top 10 an unprecedented three different times. Actually, no other song has achieved that. The song was pretty long for its day. It was three minutes and 46 seconds. The writers and the duo were afraid that DJs wouldn't play it since anything over three minutes at that time was put to the side so that more ads could be played on radio by DJs. They knew that being over the three and a half minute runtime was death for this single. So they decided to fudge the numbers. They wrote 305 on the tape and it made all the difference. Now as we get into this interview with Righteous Brother Bill Medley and writers Barry Mann and Cynthia Weil, including a couple of guests, I want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the brand I always wear. When you go to zenny.com or to this link right up here, you can do virtual try-ons on any pair you like. It's called the virtual mirror feature, and you can see exactly how the eyewear is going to look on you. You know, make sure it matches your face, your style. Like I said, you choose the look, the style, the color, the shape. Right now, you can get a complete pair of prescription glasses for just $6.95 starting at that. Again, click the info button right up here. Tell them Professor sent you. Here's the story. You've lost that love and feeling. Most played song of all time, 14 million plays and counting. I love these stories. You gotta share these stories with, with our audience about when you put that together. Because the title was a placeholder at first, Yes, right? Phil asked us to come out to California to write with him. And um, we packed up our then German Shepherd that we had, and took her with us. And we stayed at the Chateau Marmont because they would allow us to have a dog and a piano. And, a piano. and so um, Phil played us this record by the Righteous Brothers that was a local hit. Little uh, Latin loopy loo. And my babe, Elsa, my babe, talking about my baby, girl, baby, he's so fine. And it was very Sam and Dave. <laughs> Phil Spector wanted to produce us. He asked Barry and Cynthia to uh, um, write, a, write a song for us, and they wrote Love and Feeling. We went back to the hotel, and because we were inspired by our friend Lamont Dozer and Baby, I Need Your Lovin', we felt, Barry felt, that they should sing something with that kind of yearning. Yeah, oh, right. And, 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 Spector, and they yeah. told me they got that from Baby, I Need Your Lovin'. Oh, yeah. I said, how did y'all get that? Because it didn't sound like that. She said, no, no, no. We were sitting up listening to Baby, I Need You Loving by the Tops that you did. And uh, we started singing. Somehow or another, it triggered this idea of you lost that. that, that. That's how that song uh, came out. Good luck. Where's my Roy? <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, I love it. But it was great. It was great how songs inspire oh, feelings yeah. in, in certain songwriters. They pick up on, uh, they, they hear something else. You know, it triggers another it feeling. Triggers something, yeah. We wrote the song. We couldn't figure out how to end the chorus. And we called up Phil and said, um, you know, we, we don't know what to do here. And he said, you come over, we'll figure it out. Yeah, and he, and he said, he got the idea to that. I mean, it sounds silly. Yes, this song was the, that was the biggest record of all time as far as plays. And he says, you go, gone, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. I started, <laughs> it kind of made me laugh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Because after we were done playing it, which we'll get to, and Phil said, uh, you know, this is going to be the biggest record you ever had. And she said, any record that, any song that has whoa, whoa, whoa in it can never be a big record. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this song just became a giant. You lost that love and feet and now it's gone. We finished the song with Phil and we played it for the Righteous Brothers and Barry and Phil sang it. And Yeah, well, no, Phil did come up. He said, you know, go into this, you know, this part, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The Hang On Sleepy Hang on part. Sleepy bit. Yeah. You know, he said, go into that, you know, which was a, a great idea. I mean, really, it, that's what took the song to another level. The way they sang it to us, and uh, it was very different than how we recorded it. Dead silence afterwards. Bill said, sounds good, good for the Everly Brothers. 
And I understood that because I liked the Everly Brothers and I kind of sounded like them. I was very much more nasally. So uh, that and, was the first uh, thing he said. Bobby was not happy because they were used to singing something together in harmony through, through the whole song. Right. And he said, what am I supposed to do while the big guy's singing? And Phil said, you can go to the bank, you know. I so, love it. That's one of my favorite rock and roll stories ever. I gotta say, you, you can go to, go to the, the bank. bank. Yeah, you can go to the bank. Yeah. 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 And they not only could go to the bank, they could buy the bank. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me the story about what the line that made him cry. Tell me that oh, song. Oh, something yeah. beautiful's dying. Yeah, yeah, when we, yeah, when we called him up and uh, I got to the line, something beautiful's dying. He said it really, he felt like crying when he heard it. He said he got, got tears in his eyes. He could picture Phil Spector with tears in his eyes. Something beautiful's dying. It's a two octave uh, song, you know. So you have to start, you never close, you, you know, down there to get up there. So, but they wrote it, you never close your eyes. And that was kind of fast. And, and then they, I said, but I can't hit the high note. So they'd lower it. And every time they lowered it, Phil Spector would slow it down pretty soon. You never close your And uh, I bet that it was probably about a three minute record when they first wrote it, being that fast. But when they slowed it down, slowed it down and slowed it down, it became like a four minute, 15 second song, which yeah. was way wrong for 1964. Unheard of. Unheard of. Sure. They had to be uh, two minutes and 30 seconds or right. or you just couldn't get it played. We didn't stick around. We went back to New York. We weren't there for the record sessions. So then he calls to play the record for me. You know, we had heard Bill sing it, but we didn't hear him sing it so much lower. So, you know, the opening. So when he starts playing, I start screaming over the phone, Phil, you got it on the wrong speed. You know, of course, back then there were records, you know. That's right, that's different. Phil, it's on the wrong speed. Yeah. So, uh, so everything that was wrong with it kind of made it the, the kind of made it magical, and and for you know like seven, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen year old kids, this was a pretty dramatic, dynamic oh, yeah. love ballad. Before that, you know, like I said, they were hearing these. Venus, if you will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and here's this, you know, really heavy, uh, dramatic, uh, Get down on honest my love for you. song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, really kind of the animal that, that people were, were waiting for. I think it would blow people's minds today to see what you were doing in the recording studio then with, I mean, because today you have so many tracks that you can oh, use. And back then, I mean, you had a, a couple. Yeah, I th I think I and I should uh, research this. Maybe you will. You're better at it than I am. Uh, <laughs> but I think it was on either three track or four track. Mm -hmm. four like track. you said today, they you can have as, I think as many tracks yeah, as you, you want. Yeah, you can have as yeah. And uh, and Phil Spector. Yeah, if a producer, a kid today that's producing hit records, went into a studio in 19. 64, 65, and watch Phil Spector produce this record, Love and Feeling, he would, they would say, that's impossible and I can't do it. And I won't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. uh, there was like 18 rhythm guys in the studio. And you have to understand, he was mixing, EQing yep. everything and mixing. So when they were done, it wasn't, well, I'll mix it later when everybody, he had to mix it right there. And, and that's remarkable. His ears, he was brilliant, genius little guy. I'm very lucky that we had a group like the Rikers Brothers for me to write for. Oh, yeah. Because I write very rangy. I think that could be some from my, my classical background. Barry always wrote kind of from his soul and never planned anything. Uh, he just did what felt natural to him. Yeah. yeah. Well, what did you think when you heard the finished product? Because... You have that great Bill Medley vocal, but then in the end when Bobby Hatfield comes in, I uh, need you, I mean, that, yeah. that is the most emotional, gut-wrenching yes. song, part of a yes. pop song ever. Yes. I mean, yes. I'll it, argue that till the cows come home. It's great. It, <laughs> is, you know? it is great. It was a you great know? thing. Yeah, it, was a, it was like a thing yeah. for that period in time. Silla Black also, 
You guys yes. had the number, number one, one and number two song in, in the England, UK yes. at the same time. Two different versions of songs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was tell, pretty tell amazing. You, get, with, uh, you know, I don't think we were conscious of it yes, at the time. We yeah. Once something was a hit, we were on to what would be the yeah, next I know, hit. I, you know, I know, we loved the original version so much, you know, that to us, yeah. no one could be, as, yeah. it couldn't be as good as that version. But so, I mean, it's, uh, you know, Celia Black had a very, very pop version. Who hasn't recorded Love and Feeling, yeah, right? Fun. Elvis? What did you think yeah. when you heard Elvis's version? Uh, I loved it. Hollow Notes. That's the first Good. time mm -hmm. that uh, I heard a version besides yes. the Righteous Brothers. Yes. And I was like, I was like a huge Hollow Notes fan. And I thought, that is amazing. Yes. Yeah, very good. I it's, like and, and the way they, they did it for themselves, the way that record, the way a, a rock group would do it. And it worked very well for them. It really did. You never close your eyes anymore when I kiss. Top Gun came out and, and really <laughs> the thing that made that movie, one of the, the iconic moments in that movie, if not the most iconic, is when they're singing, when he, Tom Cruise gets down, you know, and sings sings to uh, Kelly McGillis in the bar, and then everybody's singing it together. You've lost that love and feeling. We knew love and feeling would have been a big hit again if they re would have released Top Gun, it yeah. out of Top Gun. They didn't release it. And, uh, but we were getting all kinds of airplay. What, what you, the you only felt. thing I didn't like about it, they never put it in the album. It was never any Until later. They, you know, yeah, did, did they, they do, do it, it later? They did. Later on, they put it on um, the 20th anniversary and like the 15th oh, anniversary. Oh, much later, yeah. yeah in uh, fact, I've got they, the record. Yeah. You know more about me than I know about Yeah, me. you certainly know more about our that's records true. that we <laughs> never knew about. Fantastic. Oh, no, I'm sure that's not true, but still. I yes, just... absolutely. <laughs> it was like a great record produced by a great producer great singers and a great song. They, and they all meshed, you know? Yeah, yeah, it was just the perfect marriage yeah. of every entity that makes a record. And yeah. that's fortunate when you can have that yeah, happen. Yeah, but now it's a completely different songwriting business. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, you know, people write tracks and now they call the melodic line <laughs> the top line. Yeah. It's no longer a song, it's a top line. And, and then they like give the it out writer. to different lyricists to write lyrics and see yeah. who they like the best. And it's it's a soulless way of songwriting. The thing that that uh, that I miss so much is, you know, as a kid, either ha having the cassette or the, the product, the physical product, putting that record on and looking, you know, picking up a record like like this, the Righteous Brothers, you know, mm -hmm. and looking at the cover and the back and reading the liner notes. Mm -hmm. That, our the new generation is missing out on that. Yeah, um, sure. It's really sad, you know, because yeah. I think that it gives you a conduit into the music, you know. Yes. A snapshot of what, uh, mm -hmm. who wrote this song yeah. and who, you know, because I always used to listen to the Top 40 Countdown with Casey Kasem. He would tell a story behind the song and, and talk about, you know, Barry Mann and Cynthia Wow, and, and they wrote these great songs in the 60s. And then he'd play a song. And, uh -huh. and that connected you to all of that music. And that's now great. it's missing. That's great. Know? And I think what you're doing is just, is just fantastic. Oh, thank you. It really is. It's yeah. great. We've got to keep these songs going in people's minds. What advice would you have for young musicians trying to make it in today's market where things have changed so much? Run like a deer. Uh, well, I have a 27-year-old daughter, 26 year old. Yeah, who's also a And she's going to be singing. She, she was born when I was recording I've Had the Time of My Life for Dirty Dancing. And now she's doing it with me. Uh, McKenna, right? McKenna. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I really worry, you know, that that it's changed so, so much that I don't, I don't even know what to tell her other than if you love it and if you need to do it, then just go do it. And you have to believe in dreams. You have to believe in magic because it's, you just work, 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 work. And then all of a sudden you're in and you'll go, holy moly, how did I get in here? And then you can't get out. <laughs> What is next for you? 
I mean, you've done everything. You've done everything. <laughs> you've got the book now. Paul McCartney, John Lennon, and Bill Medley all in, in a category. Only artists to have top three in four different decades. What's next for you? Uh, five decades. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I really don't know. You know, I'm just, at this point, I'm taking it day by day. I'm having such a great time coming out here and performing. And, and as long as my... As long as my throat's here and as long as the audiences are here, I'm, I'm here. People say, when are you going to retire? I said, I got to get a job first. <laughs> this, ain't, this ain't work. This is a 15 year old boy's dream. And, um, and I just love it. And as long as the audiences are there, I'm going to be here. Thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about this historic song. What are your memories of this song and how they've used it in pop culture over the years? Classic and Top Gun. What are your thoughts on the recording process, the wall of sound? Tell us below. Let's have a good discussion about this. If you like our videos, you like this one, we'd love to have you subscribe to be a part of our community. We're always talking about the greatest of all time. Till next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Talk to you soon.